everyone welcome to another episode of success navigation my name is haseeb and i am the founder of brankit where we help e-commerce brands to improve their supply chain and operational problems so i am very very excited today because i have fabricio here who is the ceo of fleber and also he has co-founded many other startups and has a huge experience in the tech industry so in 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 the podcast today we will be discussing about some realistic expectations about the startup environment and also our main interesting topic that i love very much the e-commerce supply chain and how fleber is solving that problem and what are the issues in this domain that most of the e-commerce sellers are facing so um, f- um fabricio i would like you to start a little bit about your introduction and just let the audience know about your background and um, how exactly fleber is solving some problems in the industry awesome yeah thank you hasib it's great to be here with you um my name is fabricio miranda i'm a co-founder and ceo of fleber um i've been an entrepreneur forever since 26 years old uh fleber is my seventh company in the retail space i also co-founded other companies uh such as quartile and sellers funding uh quartile is in the advertising advertising platform sellers funding is a lending business and um, the reason I am fully dedicated to Fleber now is that we're solving the biggest and hardest problem in retail, which is inventory. We're going to talk a lot more about that, but we are basically an inventory planning yeah. optimization tool um, uh, focused on mid-market sellers. I will explain also what that means. And uh, very excited with trying to solve this huge, huge issue in the market. So, uh, Fabricio, I would like there is one very cool world in the Gen Z uh, environment that is, you know, startup. Like every Gen Z is crazy about building a startup, starting a, you can say, starting a new company every time. So, as you have worked like in so many startup environments, and I would like to know some, you know, there is like some uh, ideation, you can say, where a person would find a problem and solve it. It's not rather just to raise an investment and, you know, just sit down and manage a team, right? So I would like to know your perspective and how one should see a startup environment and what are the, you can say, a backstage work of that is happening behind a startup. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting question because I lived in San Diego in California in the year 2000, right before the internet bubble burst. Um, And Mm -hmm. startups were everything at the time. I remember that everything was, everybody was millionaires and, and you had every like the 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 power was in total in the hands of the people trying to and they had employment everywhere. It was crazy. And, and a couple of years later, uh, that became the opposite. So 2002, 2003 was if you said you were going to open a startup, you were like the crazy guy. And 10 or 15 years ago, um, that came back to being in fashion, uh, and startup became a very uh, a very fancy thing. But honestly, there's nothing fancy about startups. The reason why I, I this is my seventh startup is because I am really wired to be a, 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 an entrepreneur. But I every new startup that I found, I regret having done that because it's so much work. It's crazy uh, the amount of work that yeah. you have. I'm 47 years old. My wife, every startup that I sell or, or have a, 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 a good liquidity event, my wife thinks that I'm going to settle down and I don't. Um, and, uh, because I'm, I, I feel that I'm, I'm addicted to this thing, but you the, have to wear like many hats in one day. Yeah. Because what, what happens is that first, most startups fail. So just to start that is as if you were going to, uh, um, skydive knowing that most parachutes don't open, right? It's kind of crazy to do that. Second founders can like, they, they, they have to have a very, uh, um, very simple frugal life because all of the money that they have in the startup, they have to try to make the startup work. So the more money you invest in a startup in the better team and everything else, the best. Uh, So you have to not draw salary or draw a very minimal salary uh, to be able for you only to survive. Uh, And so that's another thing. So like for three to four years, you're going to be surviving at, at the most. Um, if you go the route of raising capital with VC funds, you have the VC funds on your neck now and you have boards and you have to do reports and et cetera, which is also painful sometimes. Um, and you have to convince people to join you, other crazy people to join you in this journey. So nothing kind of makes sense. That said, uh, the feeling of, of seeing a problem and wanting to solve the problem mm-hmm. uh, 
and, and building something and getting other people passionate about the same problem is incomparable. There's nothing that compares to that feeling. So I think that's why, uh, you know, I always weigh in. I always say, you know, I will start a new startup. And I, and I think that people who have the, the willingness to work hard, not make a lot of money for some time, risk a lot of yeah. their, their life, it's an amazing, amazing journey. Yeah, one one point to add here. So when we are, you know, starting a startup, there is one thing that there is one problem that happens like four to five years old, and most of the people will focus to solve that problem. But there is another perspective to that. Like you see the future, you see like next five to ten years, and you see that this problem will come eventually in this industry, and then you start working on building something around that to fix that upcoming problem. So I think that is the main core idea of a successful startup, right? Yeah, uh, with, with the caveat that if you stay too for too long in a lab, kind of building something mm -hmm. too much to the future, you get very detached because it's very hard for you to really predict what's going to happen in the future. So you're totally right. But what I like uh, mentioning these cases is the story of Netflix. I don't know if you read the story of Netflix from Reed Hastings, but when you when you see this history uh, of Netflix, Netflix, you see that Reed Hastings know that the, 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 the future would be streaming of films, but he yeah. knew that the technology was not there. So he didn't stay in a lab trying to build the best streaming platform. He went out and started delivering DVDs because he knew that having those relationships with the, the filmmakers was an important part of the business. So he was a DVD delivery company for a while before becoming what Netflix is today. So that's a, a, an imp important thing for whoever is solving something that is focused on the future. 100%. Yeah, I, I would completely agree. You know, this is like a very great example to add on what earlier I said. Uh, coming down to the problems that are, you know, coming for the e-commerce supply chain industry. So as we know, this industry is like in its, you can say, very early stages right now. And it it, it is yet to be, you know, get in a structure form and companies will realize later the problems that are coming in the business as most of the founders were like, you know, young founders, they have their very first company and it got successful so uh, as i as you know we we have been talking like for almost a one year from the last one year so i would like to know a little bit that you have a, a, an a, an experience in starting a brand and you exactly know like what problems will be coming next for the e-commerce industry that is the reason you targeted the supply chain area so i would like to know some uh, some insights from you in numbers like what exactly is coming down the line in terms of supply chain problems and uh, how like you know how sellers can think about that to be prepared for that yeah if you think about um commerce overall retail overall um you'll see a huge shift from uh the the, the offline retail to the online retail you went when i started this in 2000 in this segment in 2015 Retail, online retail is only like 8% of total retail in the U.S. Today is about 22 to 25% um, of total retail. And nobody has a question that this is going to be like 50% like in a few years from now. I don't know how many years it's impossible to predict, but I would say 10 years, 15 years. You, know, you never know. Yeah. But 50%, it's easy for you to predict that we're going to get there. Um, so it's a huge shifting in business model. If you think about the, the model of offline retail, is all about having products in stores to enable sales. So sales are enabled by a product on a shelf, physical shelf. So the inventory has to be spread across as many stores as possible. The more shelves you put your product, the more potential sales you have. And all everything is done around that physical distribution of, 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 invent, of inventory of products. And when you move more online, um, what happens is that the sale now is enabled by a digital uh, uh, interface, which is a listing or, or a, a website. Um, and now you don't need the product anymore uh, to, to enable the sale. You just need a product after you execute a sale to a customer. The sale is digital, right? So that yep. shifts completely the business model of retail. The business model is new. The, the, this new world of retail carries with it a new business model, operating model. And that changes a lot of, of, of what's happening and what's going to happen. And it's directly connected to the supply chain issues that we saw uh, because what happened is that you have sales being digitized. So it's really easy for you to sell. It's really easy for you to change something related to sales. It's just a click of a mouse. Um, and you have a physical distribution of goods that, that, that needs to be physically in the house of someone. So this mismatch between a, a digitized sales process and a physical distribution 
is what creates uh, the, the, the problems that we see today uh, that, 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 that disrupt the way the industry operates. And honestly, this is only going to get worse. I think people are thinking that this is gone and this was just a COVID thing. And uh, the reason why it's getting better is because everybody piled up in inventory. So all of the brands are overstocked at the moment. And also this potential economic crisis uh, uh, reduced a little bit consumption, yeah. um, especially of goods that are not essential. So when you see again, inventory is getting back to normal levels and, and economy picking up, we're again going to see issues with the yeah. supply chain. Yeah. Because As of we yeah, as we discussed like uh, earlier today, so it is getting back on the trend line. So it went up in COVID, but it is still on the trend line and it is supposed to be getting uh, towards rise in future. Exactly. So so yeah. the retail, the online retail is gonna, going to continue picking up. And, and But what happens also is that with the shifting business model, it, it shifts also the model of the retail, uh, the, the offline retail. So the offline retail, which we call a modern, modern commerce today, is an, a store that is connected to the same system that the online sales go through. So you're talking about Shopify POS, you're talking about Square, um, uh, and systems that are digitizing the information, the data in, this, in the retail store. And what we're going to see more and more is retail stores also consolidating inventory with offline uh, with online uh, retail. So all of that offline, online, that will become a blurred um, a uh, I think a, a blurred line that you, you will not have this distinction. You're going to go uh, in a store, you're going to purchase something, but that, per that something is going to be delivered to your door two hours later, two days later, depending on, on the format. Um, and you're going online to research something and then you're going to try it out offline. So all of these things are going to be blurred, which adds a lot of complexity to inventory, um, which we can you know go deeper if you want. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, it is all about getting deeper into those areas. So uh, coming to Fleabird, like, uh, let's discuss a little bit about Fleabird. So we have discussed all these problems that are coming and that will be keep on increasing. So we have like a lot of tools coming on right now, like for the last two years, there are many tools coming in the uh, inventory management space, especially for uh, solving the e-commerce supply chain problem. So uh, can you just give some depth about what Fleabird is and how different it is operating than other tools that are right now in the industry? Yeah, before entering in the competition and Fleabird itself, uh, why we exist? Uh, uh, it's yeah, because, it's because the, the if you think about the digitization of the supply chain, supply chain is a segment that has never received a lot of investment over time. Exactly. Uh, and, and the reflection, as you can see with your customers and I can see with my customers. The it, thing is, it is not very shining like marketing. You know, marketing exactly. is like a shiny stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's the boring. I, we're solving the boring problem. But, but um, in the end of the day, every single company operates on top of a spreadsheet or an internal system that they developed. And I'm not talking about small, small companies. I'm talking about companies selling literally billions of dollars. Yep. They're operating on top of spreadsheets. And, and and built and systems built internally, 100%. and that's that's a reflection of, of a very low investment in supply chain in history. And then we start having companies that are that start digitizing verticals of the supply chain. So you see companies like Envil, which is a dear uh, um, uh, partner that we have, strategic partner that we have. Envil digitizes the production management of the products. Uh, Flexport, which is another partner of ours, digitizes freight. Um, you see convoy digitizing trucking. You see deliver digitizing fulfillment. Oh, yes. uh, so uh, there's a lot of companies digitizing all those verticals. But in the end of the day, as I, as I said to one of the co-founders of Flexport, uh, they are transporting very efficiently with a lot of visibility the wrong product to the wrong place at the wrong time in the wrong quantity. Because the solution is not only in transporting the container efficiently, is in knowing what is inside of that container. Yeah. And that is the main problem we have today in, in, in retail, is that people are either stocked out or overstocked because there's a huge mismanagement of the quantity that you need to order or where you need to send it, what is the best route, what is, like all these things are, are uh, uh, not solved yet. And that's what Fleabird is solving. So what we're solving is what needs to be inside of the container so that Flexport can transport it efficiently, Convoy can transport it efficiently, uh, Envil can mo monitor the production efficiently, uh, deliver can fulfill it efficiently. Um, 
And how we do that? So we do that through a, a inventory planning platform that is very, very uh, uh, different than all of the other platforms in the market. And I, I, I can explain why. Uh, basically, I don't know how CB if you want to ask, ask something or if I can keep going. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, uh, I want to know, this is what we discussed earlier as well. Fleeber is operating as a brain between all these other systems and it is connecting everything at one place to, for, you know, if you order, if you are ordering something, Anvil is placing that purchase order, but you don't know if that quantity is right or wrong. So that is where uh, Fleeber is coming. And I would like to know, go more a little bit in that depth, like how exactly it is solving that problem and what is unique inside. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, yeah, so uh, you have basically three types of, of, of tools in the market. You have the very unsophisticated tools focused on the small, very small sellers, most of them focused on Amazon. Uh, you have the very sophisticated tools that are almost like ERPs. You have six months to a year of implementation, and it becomes kind of a legacy system, and it's used by Coca-Cola, Nike, and et cetera. And you didn't have nothing in between. So that's where we come in. We come with the same sophistication of the big tools with big data science team, AI, and, and a lot of things that, that make the, the, the quality of what we're doing much better. Uh, and we are tailored to mid-market, to companies that are getting like 5 to 10 million of sales up. Uh, we have customers in the hundreds of millions. Um, and the idea is that we can provide, we can simplify the inventory uh, planning and optimization uh, as sales has been simplified by Amazon, Shopify, and et cetera. Um, the way we're different is because we, I, can't, I, I, I think that we see the future different. Uh, we see the future as a future where uh, literally operating a, a, a inventory for your company is based on clicks of approval as it is today operating sales. Um, mm -hmm. So we're not very only worried actually about giving data and, and so that the customer can have the access to data to make the decisions. We're also worried in making that data not only easier to digest, to prioritize, uh, but also easier for you to make decisions, uh, recommending also decisions for you, and also connecting with the sources of execution that you need. Like if you need to send to an ERP, it's going to be sent automatically. Yeah. If you need it to send to Envil, it will be sent automatically, Flexport. And, oh, and, and, you know, NetSuite and, and Deliver and everything else. So there's actually not, not other tools doing the same thing as we're doing, although there is a couple of tools uh, competing with us in, in this mid-market segment. Uh, got it. There are two areas that I want to dig down a little bit more. So there is one important part that uh, that is missing in most of the companies that is relation between marketing and supply chain. You know, marketing will keep on developing products and they have some insights from the market, they will keep on pushing sales, but they will not inform the supply chain team about those decisions. So that is something very important to keep the supply chain streamlined. Uh, let, let's explain a little bit about that, those options of Fleeber where it is minimizing that gap between two departments. Oh, that's a, an amazing yeah. subject because I also co-founded Quartile, which is the advertising platform. Uh, and the idea is exactly what you're saying because what happens today is that the customers are uh, split internally between a sales team and sales and branding yeah. team and the operations team. The sales and brand team are making decisions kind of blind to what's going to happen with inventory and the operations team is playing the catch up game. So it's a lose lose because you're investing more in advertising, reducing price, which reduces your margin. And you're doing that just to run out of stock two weeks later. Uh, and, while you're doing that, the operations team is seeing, oh, my God, we're going to run out of stock. So let's bring things by air and spending a lot more in supply chain than they should. So it's lose, lose, lose for all sides. Everybody loses in this relationship. And this is due to lack of visibility and connection. So Fleeber tries to bring these two worlds connected. So we start with uh, the demand planning, which is what the, 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 the brand and sales team should be focused on giving us an input to uh, operations. And then we go to the to the inventory planning and then the supply chain operations, inventory uh, operations, supply chain operations. The demand planning is connected with the inventory planning. So yeah. if you're demanding something that is going to make a difference in your, in your future inventory availability, you will be uh, um, uh, alerted of that something in real yeah. time. 
and that makes a huge difference. I completely agree with you, Hasi. Yeah, that, and that. I'm, I'm using this tool like, you know, for the last one year. So there is one other cool function to go on, dig down on SKU level and find out like this is the growth of this SKU. And we can align marketing by giving them access to the tool and coming down to those SKUs and, uh, you know, assign percentages and growth to those particular SKUs so that we get right predictions at the right time. So uh, definitely these all functions add a lot to minimizing that gap. There is one more area, you know, you have mentioned AI here and I was earlier reading your comment uh, with Chad Rubin regarding like you know you must have to you like most of the companies are talking about ai but they don't have any data engineer in their whole team so i would like to know what areas you are working on in that area like ai is just getting popular right now just because of a you can say chat gpt uh, boom but it is you know something that is existing for the last uh, four or five years or more than that so i would like to know how you are utilizing that part in your uh, tools yeah, AI is a big, huge subject, and and I completely agree with Chad that a lot of people talk about AI, and very, very few actually have AI. And I even made a comment, you know, just ask them how many data scientists they have in the team, and and you know if they have AI or not. Um, retail is a, a a segment that carries a lot of data. So once we, for example, once we onboard a new brand, we download the full history of sales and all of the other data that you have related to inventory and sales of that brand. Um, and that is a lot. It's huge, huge, huge amounts of data. And AI is great at understanding big chunks of data, much, much better than, than, than humans by far, and much better than an Excel spreadsheet would do, for example, because what is unique to AI is that it has machine learning embedded in most of the algorithms that you use. So you are learning with that. every time there's a new sale, you learn with it. It's just chat, chat GPT. If you learn about how chat GPT works, yeah. it's exactly that. Every time there's a new sentence on the internet that has a relationship with what you're searching, that will make chat GPT more accurate in understanding what you want. And it's the same thing with, with retail. So every new sale you make, that will make our algorithms understand better your sales pattern and then predict better what is the next sales that you're going to have. And same thing with inventory. So we're, we're investing a lot in optimization. Um, so the idea is that we are able to tell a brand, for example, Hey, you're, you're putting here that you want, you, you have a 60 day lead time, but actually you're having a 72 day lead time on average. So you should be careful with that because you're getting late uh, shipments because of your input of 60 days, you should use 72. Same with minimum days of stock, which is the safety stock. So a lot of, most of the companies, most of our customers just say, oh, you know what? Just put 30 days of, or 15 days or 45, whatever they want as the minimum days of stock. And, but if you think about each product, the minimum days of stock should be different because products that are very easy to predict the future, uh, you're very accurate in your prediction. They don't need as many uh, products sitting there as safety stock as products that are very uh, 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 hard to predict the future. Same thing with uh, the predictability of your supply chain. Products that you always have the same lead time, like it's always 60 days. Hmm. Those are very predictable to understand that you're going to have 60 days the next time. Products that are all over the place, one time is 20 days, one time is 100, another time is 60. You need to carry more inventory as safe to stock for those products because you never know what's going to happen in the next time. So this is the kind of things that we're working now in parallel, of course, with the, the state of the art. We're by far, and, and I challenge any other tool in the market to come talk to us and, 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 and do whatever comparison that, uh, they want. But we're by far the most robust uh, demand planning tool for mid-market uh, today. Uh, yeah. Because of our yeah, coming to this AI part, like it will take, it will still take some time to you know get evolve and uh, get correct data predictions from what inputs we are giving it right now. So uh, I think it is still in a developing stage, but it is great that Fleber is you know highly focusing on that area to get incorporated that in their tool, so that uh, in future we will have like more good predictions because the whole time you are feeding it some data it will keep on learning and yeah. it will keep getting better exactly. so uh yeah so this is something you know really great and uh maybe most some other tools will be watching that podcast so they might come challenge you as well yeah 
perfect uh, another um, one one more question that i would like to know about fleber is like what is the product development map like what is coming down the line in terms of new features or anything new that you are like amazon is evolving right sales channels are evolving so you need to catch you need to know how these are evolving so that we can keep getting better and get you know get to their pace and get the right data from that so what is the road map down the line that fleba is looking at and what new changes are coming yeah uh, it's it's very what's happening with retail is crazy because uh when i started there was a very clear uh, line between you know amazon marketplace sellers and and d2c and retail mm -hmm. And these lines now are all blurred. Uh, you yeah. see everyone wanting to sell everywhere. The problem is that selling is really easy because it's mostly digital. So if you are, you open a new account on Shopify for $39 and you're selling the next day on Shopify, right? But now you're selling on Shopify, but you're, you used to sell only, only on Amazon if you were only an Amazon seller and your inventory was on FBA. But now Shopify, you're either going to fulfill from FBA, which is a little expensive, or you're going to start having an, uh, uh, another storage warehouse where you're carrying inventory for fulfilling to Shopify, like a 3PL, for example. And then you say, oh, uh, I decide to, to start selling wholesale. And then you just go to wholesale uh, uh, um, uh, companies and, and, and negotiate a wholesale sale. And boom, you're selling wholesale. And then you start to sell subscription. You just go on Shopify, you turn on the subscription, you, you download like an app for subscription and boom, you're selling subscription. And all of these things are very easy to do nowadays. But the inventory is crazy at each one of these changes. It's crazy what happens with inventory. So you have uh, wholesale is another beast. Wholesale, yeah. you're actually... Uh, you don't sell anything and suddenly you send 2,000 orders and not anything and then 1,200 orders. So it's completely different from a, a pattern of sales. Subscriptions is the same. You cannot, you have to allocate inventory, pre-reserve inventory for your subscri future subscriptions because you cannot come to your customer and say, hey, this month you're not going yeah, to have a product out of stock, right? Uh, and the same with bundles. Bundles is another beast because you say, oh, I want to sell bundles and you just turn it uh um, a, a, a little key on, on Shopify and download an app and you're selling bundles, but bundles add a whole new complexity to inventory. So this year is all about capability. So we're, we're adding all capabilities that we still don't have. We have bundles, we have wholesale, uh, we have a connection to all the e-commerce the, the e uh, and, and marketplaces, but there are some things like subscriptions that is still very, uh, um, it's not very robust uh, inside of Fleber. Um, you have um, back orders, like you're ordering, pro you're selling products, even though you're stocked out. So it's a little small things related to capabilities. And also inventory planning. We're going to add a lot of things. You're going to see that, Hasib, a lot of uh, tools related to planning better your inventory. So give you better visibility. Uh, uh, you're able, for example, in the forecast today, you're only able to see one forecast on the chart. You're going to be able to see multiple and compare them. Uh, so there's a bunch of things that we're doing to make the the inventory planning easier. Great, and yeah, recently you know uh, there's one other function that was released uh, relating to creating shipments just staying in Fleber, and shipment will be created on Amazon. So that is something you know really cool. Like you don't have to give access to the supply chain team for the whole Amazon account. Exactly, and that is something really great. No, and also there's if you selling multiple marketplaces and you would have to go to different seller selling accounts to. Uh, to, to create the shipments, which by by itself, it's a major burden. Yeah, uh, you can do everything in, in a, like a simple place with a simple click, right? So it makes exactly the life a lot lot easier. Yeah, and in, in is the, uh, this bundle function is like quite you know quite unique for me because right now last night we were discussing like uh, you can say one hour on one bundle issue that we were having with uh, another our ERP system. So we were trying to mitigate how that order will be fulfilled. But anyways, that is like, you know, a very good area to explore. And definitely we will see how Fleber works around that. Okay. Uh, last question I have for you, because we have this, we have, you know, stay, stay connected for the last one year. So you have been working with people from Pakistan in your early e-commerce journey. So I would like to know how that was and uh, um, how actually you found working with us. Yeah, I have dear friends in Pakistan because of that. Um, I, so we were, 
um, the company that I founded in, in to sell products on Amazon. That's how I, I came into the segment. Uh, so long story short, I, a friend of mine uh, was opening a, com a company to sell on Amazon. I didn't even know that was a business at the time. I was uh, managing a hedge fund in Manhattan at the time. Um, and, um, and, and when he told me that only 8% of retail was online, I got intrigued. I decided to talk to him and see what, what he was doing. And he explained to me about Amazon and long story short, uh, I ended up opening this company with him and that's how I got into the segment. Um, and we were the biggest sellers of this, uh, Himalayan salt lamps. Um, and the Himalayan salt lamps are sourced in Pakistan. And I, because of that, uh, I became very close to Pakistanis. And I, I, I love the work ethic of, of Pakistanis. It's crazy, related, like the, the, how hard you guys work and, 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 and how, how friendly you are. So I even uh, gave uh, a letter of recommendation for, for two of them to come visit in the U.S. to get a visa at the time. Uh, that's how close I got to them. Um, and yeah, I, I have a, a, a very high, um, I think, the, my a very close people. relation, you know, with Pakistani people. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, that is, you know, for me, it is like quite good to hear. And at the same time, it feels like a responsibility as well that, you know, you are delivering that high value and you need to be very careful while uh, being working with all the international clients so that you know you meet that expectation of the delivery and at the same time if someone is appreciating you i think that is very great and uh, you will see you know a lot of uh, supply chain professionals down the line coming from pakistan and uh, working on all these crazy areas yeah and i want to see Branket being kind of the the source of that spark you know, which I, yeah, yeah. I already told you that i i feel that way about you guys Perfect, perfect. Uh, I think we, we are already on the timeline. So uh, let's stick to that. And thank you, for, uh, Fabricio, for all your time and discussing all these great insights about this new part in the industry. No, thank you for uh, the time here with me and giving me this opportunity to talk to you. Perfect. Um, have a great day to you. And uh, yeah, we will, you know, do some other podcasts to get into more details. Awesome. Great. Perfect. Have a great day. Bye. Yes. Bye-bye.